The time is 12.45 a.m. Mr. Murdoch pr prepares boat 5 for launching. He orders Officer Bitman to take charge of it and amongst those rowing it is Quartermaster Oliver. Mr. Ismay comes to Bitman and tells him to start loading his boat because there is no time to waste. But Bitman does not recognize him and says, I will wait for the commander's orders. Just then, Captain Smith tells him to start loading the boat. As the boat is being lowered, two male passengers jump into it, injuring at least one female passenger. Mr. Murdoch cannot let chaos break out, so he places Lowe in charge, in charge of the lifeboat crane and leaves to find the officers, Lightoller and Wilde, so that they can fetch the guns. And ladies and gentlemen, that's how guns entered the story. It's at this point that Mr. Ismay shows up and sees lifeboat 5 being lowered. In a panic attack, he grabs the falls and shouts, lower away, lower away. Officer Lowe stops him and shouts at him, giving him a long lecture. Humiliated, Mr. Ismay walks to boat number three. As boat number five is being lowered, Murdoch shakes hands with Pitman and tells him, goodbye and good luck, to which Pitman replies, lower away. Boat 5 had the same capacity as boat 7, but the number of occupants is unknown. Estimates vary from as low as 35 to as high as over 50. Officer Pittman later said that he rode to boat 7 and transferred four people to that boat. One woman, a child, and two men. At 12.47, Boxhall arrives at the bridge and sees what he believes are masthead lights of a nearby ship. He fires the first distressed rocket to gain the ship's attention. At 12.55, boat 3 is launched from starboard side. It is said that the crewmen's hands were so badly affected by the cold that they dropped two oars into the sea. This boat also does not have any light, like there's no flares or oil lamps or anything. Able seaman George Moore is placed in charge with another able seaman. Charles Pasco assisting him among some others with rowing and again despite having the same capacity as boat 5 and 7 this boat only carries around 40 people estimates actually vary from 32 to 38 at 1 a.m. the port side launches its first boat boat 8 is launched by light Toller with assistance from Captain Smith and officer Wilde Again, this boat has the same capacity as boat 3, but it only carries around 20 people. And that's because Light Dollar has not allowed any men on board except the crewmen who are charged with rowing. To be exact, Abel Seaman Jones and Stewart John Hart. And amongst the occupants is the Countess of Roths, who will later help with the rowing. Ada Stross is offered a seat but she refuses to leave her husband Isidore alone and walks off with him which is actually a very you know famous story about this disaster none of them survived they both said that they wanted to give young people a chance because they have already completed their lives now this boat is told by Captain Smith to row towards the mystery ship spotted by Boxhall at 105 on the starboard side boat one is launched now this boat is an emergency cutter it only has a capacity of 40 people but for some reason it's only carrying 12 seven of which are crewmen who are rowing the boat so basically five passengers lookout George Simons is placed in charge and the people in this boat were the Duff Gordons and their you know friends to this day it's a scandal that they supposedly bribed these men so that they could escape. We don't know if this scandal is true or not, but it's still a controversy to this day. At 1.10, boat 6 is launched from the port side. Quartermaster Robert Hitchens is placed in charge, and lookout Frederick Fleet is the only other man in this boat. The most famous occupant of this boat was Molly Brown, and what most people may not know was that a Syrian American named Fahim Philip Ruhana Azaini tried to get on board, 
but Lytoller prevents him. So what he does is that wait and once Lytoller looks, looks away, he jumps and hides in the boat. Fahim is the first third class passenger to escape from the sinking ship and later on he will help with rowing in gratitude to the boat's occupants. Hitchens calls out Lytoller as the boat is being lowered saying we need help with rowing. Lytoller asks a crowd of men standing near him if any of them is a sailor. Major Arthur Puchin, a member of the Canadian Rifles, replies, he is. Captain Smith tells him to go below to deck the promenade deck, break a window, and then get into the boat. But Lightoller says, if he's a good sailor, he must be able to swing this rope, referring to the falls. So Arthur accepts the challenge and swings himself down the 25 meter rope into the boat. Boat 6 then leaves with nearly 20 to 22 people, despite a capacity of 65. At 1.20, Boat 16 is launched from the port side. Master at Arms Henry Bailey is placed in charge. This boat has only two other men beside him. Able Seaman Ernst Archer and second class Salon Stewart Charles Andrews. Violet Jessop leaves in this boat and despite a capacity of 65, Again, this boat is only carrying 44. At 1.25, boat 14 is launched from the port side. Officer Low is placed in charge of this boat and it carries around 40 people, despite a capacity of 65. The only other men beside him are three stewards and able seaman Joseph Scarrett. And as this boat is being lowered, Officer Low actually fires his seven gunshot Browning automatic gun three times because he said there were men around him and he wanted them to get away and at some point what happened was that a youth came inside and at first Lowe threatened him at gunpoint but later told him for God's sake we have got women and children to save and just forced him to get out. The youth stayed on deck with his head down and was never seen again. At 1.30 a.m. boat 12 is launched from the port side and able seaman Frederick Clench is placed in charge of this boat. The only other man with him is another able seaman, Jean Poindester. And this boat is carrying around 30 people despite a capacity of 65. While on the starboard side, boat 9 is launched at the same time. Here, the bosun's mate Albert Haynes is placed in charge and this boat is carrying around 56 people. At 1.35, boat 11 is launched from the starboard side. Quartermaster Sidney Humphreys is placed in charge of this boat. At 1.05 a.m. on the starboard side, boat 1 is launched. Now this boat is an emergency cutter with a capacity of 40 people but for some reason it only carries 12, 7 of which are crewmen who are supposed to row the boat. Lookout George Simons is placed in boat and the Duff Gordons are alleged to have bribed the crew to let them escape. It's a very bizarre scandal which survives to this day but no one has the answers for it. At 1.10 Boat 6 is launched from the port side. Quartermaster Robert Hitchens is placed in charge. Lookout Frederick Fleet is the only other man with him. The most famous occupant of this boat is the unsinkable Molly Brown. Now what most people may not know is that while this boat was being loaded, there was a Syrian American nearby named Fahim Philip Rohana Azaini. So Fahim tried to get on board but Lightoller prevented him. So he waited and once Lightoller looked away, he jumped in and hid inside the boat. Fahim is the first third class passenger to escape from the sinking ship. Later he will help with rowing in gratitude to the boat's occupants. Hitchens called out, calls out Lightoller as the boat's being lowered that he needs help with rowing. Lightoller asks a crowd of men standing near him if any one of them is a sailor. Major Arthur Puchin, a member of Canadian Rifles, replies he is. Captain Smith tells him to go below to the promenade deck, break a window and, and get into the boat. But Lightola tells him, if he's a good sailor, he must be able to swing this rope, referring to the falls. 
Arthur accepts the challenge and swings himself down the 25 meter rope into the boat. Boat 6 then leaves with nearly 20 to 22 people, despite a capacity of 65. At 1.20, boat 16 is launched from the port side. Master at Arms Henry Bailey is placed in charge of this boat, and there are only two other men assisting him. Able seaman Ernest Archer and second class saloon steward Charles Andrews. Violet Dussop escapes in this boat. And again, despite a capacity of 65, this boat is carrying around 44 people. At 125, boat 14 is launched from the port side. Officer Lowe is placed in charge and this boat carries around 40 people despite a capacity of 65. The only other men with him are three stewards and able seaman Joseph Scarrett. Now records uh, mention this and Lowe himself admitted that while the boat was being launched, he fired his gun three times to scare away a group of men who were, you know, perhaps planning to jump in. And another event happened was that there was a youth inside the boat. First, Lowe threatened him at gunpoint, but later told him, for God's sake, we have got women and children to save. So he forced him to get out, and the youth was never seen again. At 1.30, boat 12 is launched from the port side. Able seaman Frederick Clench is placed in charge, and the only other man with him is another able seaman, John, John Poindaster. And this boat is carrying around 30 people despite a capacity of 65. Meanwhile, on the starboard side, boat 9 is launched. Boson's mate Albert Haynes is placed in charge of this boat. It carries around 56 people. At 1.35, boat 11 is launched from the starboard side. Quartermaster Sidney Humphreys is placed in charge and this boat carries 70 people the only one loaded to maximum capacity. At 1.40, a tragic event is avoided. On the starboard side, boat 13 is launched from the starboard side with nearly 70 people. But then as soon as it reaches water, the flow of water from the pumps below decks pushes it, it aft. And that's where boat 15 is supposed to land. The deck crew starts lowering boat 15, but the occupants of boat 13 shouted them to stop. At last they stop and Barrett quickly cuts the falls, which are the ropes connecting, uh, you know, the, sh the boat to the ship. And afterwards, boat 13 rose away from the Titanic and they elect Barrett as their leader. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, the second hour is complete.